We're on lecture outline number nine. We're going to try and finish it out with this video. Let's see how it goes. We're back to talking about the electron configuration, configurations of ions. Uh, remember, atoms always lose the highest energy electrons first. These are always with the highest value of n. If we look at the electron configurations of iron atoms and ions, and we refer to our periodic table, iron is right here, 26 electrons. Same first 18 electrons as argon, 4s2, 3d6. As we go to the iron 2 ion, we lose two electrons. Those are the 4s2 electrons, and we're left with argon 3d6. And argon 3d5. Where we noted before that since the d sublevel has five orbitals, the 3d portion of the orbital energy diagram would have five unpaired electrons. While iron 2 plus One, two, three, four, five, six has four unpaired electrons. It's a lot of unpaired electrons. I want to define two new terms, paramagnetic and diamagnetic. For uh, paramagnetic, a substance is a paramagnetic substance if it has at least one unpaired electron. And a substance is diamagnetic if it has all electrons paired. And so referring back to now the previous examples, both iron 2 plus, actually iron, iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus are all paramagnetic species. While uh, an example of a diamagnetic species would be a zinc atom. Looking at its position on the periodic table, zinc is right here. It will have the same first 18 electrons as argon, 4s2, 3d10. Zinc 2 plus, also a diamagnetic species. Because it loses the 4s electrons. Now, um, atoms or ions that lose electrons become smaller. I think uh, that's, uh, that is generally true. That, that is true uh, more than generally. However, uh, here's an easy example. If we look at a potassium atom versus a potassium ion, we have argon 4s1 one electron in the n equals four level. As we go to K plus, we lose that 4s1 electron and the highest value of n is now n equals three. So we lost a whole energy level. We know that n equals four is a lot larger than n equals three, n equals two, n equals one. So of course it becomes smaller. Another thing to point out, is that the potassium ion, uh, while it has uh, the same electrons as argon, argon does have eight valence electrons, just all of its valence electrons are now in N equals three. Now, uh, let's talk about uh, C, atoms ions that gain electrons become larger. It's a little bit harder to see, uh, but let's talk about it. 
And the example I want to give is a chlorine atom versus a chloride ion. Looking at chlorine's position on the periodic table, we go backwards to find the noble gas core for neon, then 3s2, 3p5. While chloride ion gains one electron, it has eight valence electrons, same valence electrons as argon, So you could also write it just as a noble gas core for argon. Either way works. Now, um, but what I wanted to point out about this is uh, you're filling the same sublevel. Uh, you're filling an orbital that already has an electron in it. What makes it larger? This is a little bit more subtle, and it goes to the fact that you're putting an electron in an orbital that already has an electron that will experience electron-electron repulsions. which will make it bigger, make Cl minus bigger, okay? So trends here, lose electrons become smaller, gain electrons become larger, um, let's see. And uh, before I do D, I wanna point out that in both of these cases, potassium is involved, so it has the same number of protons, both of these, Chlorine is involved, it has the same number of protons as well. Now I wanna talk about what's called an isoelectronic series. Isoelectronic series are atoms or ions with the same number of electrons, but different numbers of protons. And as you might guess, more protons has more ability to pull electrons closer to the nucleus a larger effective nuclear charge and will be smaller. So same electrons, but more protons leads to smaller atom or ion. And on one level, so much of chemistry can be understood in terms of the positions of positive and negative charges like this. All right, so as an example, we're going to pull uh, sulfur two minus. Fluoride minus argon, potassium, and calcium two plus. This is going to be an isoelectronic series meaning that if we look at the number of electrons, sulfur has 16 electrons for the atom, add two more for the charge, 18 electrons, chlorine, argon, uh, both as well, potassium ion, potassium atom has 19, lose one, calcium atom lose two. So same number of electrons, isoelectronic series. For number of protons, well, these are just the atomic numbers or the numbers on top. So among all of these, we would say same number of electrons, most protons, smallest. largest. That is an isoelectronic series. Now, uh, as far as losing electrons, let's look at something called the ionization energy reaction. That is another reaction that I can ask you to write. Uh, yeah, I can ask you to write this one. So let's uh, underline that. Ionization energy reaction is the minimum amount of energy required to remove the most loosely held electron from an isolated gaseous atom or ion. And so as an example, we'll do the ionization energy for uh, reaction for magnesium. It starts with a magnesium gas atom. Metals in the gas phase, not something we're used to seeing, uh, but 
for ionization energy rea reactions, everything is in the gas phase. The reason being this key word here, isolated. If you remember back to our discussion about gases, we said that a gas particle had 10 diameters of space in all directions around it, more or less. Therefore, there are no or no significant intermolecular forces, no attractions, and so that's what isolated means. We're not worried about anything else. This exists all by itself in the universe as far as it knows, or at least when we use it as an ideal gas, that's the approximation. Anyway, back to the reaction. Magnesium gas loses one electron to become magnesium plus gas, and that one electron is a product. Now, this is a reaction. It has a delta H of reaction, and I'm going to call this delta H IE1 for ionization energy one. And let me look sure, yep. The ionization energy, or the delta H, the energy associated with this reaction, 738 kilojoules per mole. That is an endothermic process. That means to remove an electron from magnesium and most things, including metals and other phases, requires energy. This is endothermic, okay? And we could write uh, ionization energy reactions for a whole bunch of stuff. Let's focus on magnesium for a minute. And you'll always write it one electron at a time. So first ionization energy removes one electron. All right, now let's look at the first ionization energy for the first 20 elements. What we note is that as we go from hydrogen to helium, the ionization energy trends upwards. As we go from lithium to neon across the same period, the ionization energy trends upwards, though there are a couple bumps. Same thing here for group three first 20 elements, still repeating that. So as you go from left to right across a row in the periodic table or a period, so across a row, across a period, ionization energy increases. because the atoms are smaller and it gets harder to remove those electrons. Well, to complete the thought, the atoms are smaller, electrons are closer to the nucleus and harder to remove. A close-up here shows that there are some filled subshell and half-filled subshell effects. We saw something similar when we were talking about uh, the exceptions to the shape of the periodic rule for the coinage metals as far as electron configurations go and for chromium and molybdenum. Similar things are going on here as well. Now, Let's do the second ionization energy reaction. It is for removal of the second electron. It means that we're starting with a magnesium plus one. It is in the gas phase. We remove a second electron to get magnesium plus two, again in the gas phase. This one will be delta H IE2. And uh, let me make sure I get this number right. Well, 1,450 kilojoules per mole. And uh, I'm gonna suggest that in some ways, perhaps we can understand that is as you go from first ionization energy, you have a plus one, minus one. 
So you're separating a plus one minus one charge from each other. Here you have plus two minus one, you have twice as much charge. It's gonna take twice as much energy. So compared to IE1, or compared to delta H IE1, delta H IE2 is double because the charges, the positive charge involved is double. All right, ready for ionization energy for reaction number three. Start with Mg2 plus. Oop, tempting to write aqueous. Remove that third electron. This time we get delta H IE3 equal to what? 7,730. All right. That is a lot bigger than we might expect. What's going on here? Well, uh, so much can be learned from going back to the electron configurations. If we look at the electron configuration of Mg2+, plus, we would see that Mg2+, plus, well, here's Mg, 12 electrons. Take away one, take away two. We're at a noble gas core of neon. Take away another electron, we're back to nine electrons. One S2, two S2, two P5. This energy, so uh, if we were to do this and it was just charges, so just plus three and minus one, we would expect somewhere around 22, 2300 kilojoules per mole. But it's much larger than that. And the reason is this is evidence anyway, this is not a justification or a theory as to why, but noble gas cores are being filled are extremely stable and extremely hard to break up. Noble gas cores of electron are extremely stable Uh, it takes a lot of energy to break them up. And what we're going to see is that when we talk about bonding is that all of the bonds that are occurring are attempting to get species that have noble gas cores, not all, but pretty much all of them in Chem 1010 anyway, uh, to make uh, noble gas cores and then allow as part of the bonding process. Now, I said you have to be able to write a, uh, an ionization energy reaction. I'm gonna tell you about an electron affinity reaction. You will be expected to know how to write that as well. Electron affinity, affinity means likes. So if you like an electron, and we'll do this for chlorine. Still, we're in the gas phase. This time, we're adding an electron. Our product is a gaseous chloride ion, or Cl minus. Here, ooh. This is EA1. If we think about this, we're moving from an electron configuration that does not have a noble gas core to something that does have a noble gas core. 
Turns out this is exothermic. That means that when we create this species, it has a lower potential energy than the reactants. That is because it has a noble gas core. Now, uh, we're gonna run through a couple more terms. We're almost done here, hold on. Electronegativity, the ability of a covalently bonded atom to attract bonding electrons. You do have to know that definition, even though we haven't talked about bonds yet, because uh, it will help you as we come to the next lecture outline. Metallic character, good conductors of heat and electricity, malleable, ductile, so malleable can be bent, ductile, uh, can be made into thin sheets and shiny when not covered in metal oxides. All right, now it is time for a summary of trends in the periodic table that you have to know. As you go this way and down, a bunch of things happens. happen. Atomic size increases. An atomic size, we could also say atomic radii, uh, radius, increases. So getting bigger, getting bigger. Um, ionization energy decreases. And this is the way I remember it. As the atomic size increases, the electrons are getting farther and farther away from the nucleus and easier to remove. Removing an electron is the ionization energy. Uh, electronegativity. Decreases. Finally, metallic character increases. There's always a couple questions on the exam about, meta uh, about these trends. Actually, I would say when you memorize them, memorize them from the top down uh, because the atomic size is the one that I ask about the most. So atomic size increases. I do wanna say a couple things about this last one, metallic character. So uh, all the way over on the periodic table, these are the metals. Uh, all the way down here in cesium in the corner are the most metally of metals, meaning they have the best, they are the best conductors of heat and electricity. They are best at being malleable, ductile, and shiny. However, they are so reactive that they're always covered in oxide and or reacting with water. When we think about what wires are made of, we actually use copper, silver, gold, well, that's very expensive to do, but it is done. Aluminum, all the wires come from over here. They're not the best conductors. They're the best conductors that are not reacting with water. So the metals, they're very good conductors that are also stable in air. And with that, that ends this lecture outline. Stay healthy, people.